All right, everybody, we're going to start letting everyone in our Zoom room here. So just bear with us for a few moments while we make sure we're streaming and get everybody in here. We're also going to be streaming on Facebook. So if you're watching there, hello, but just give us about 20 seconds and we'll get started. Okay. Hey, everybody. This is Jeff Martin with Magic City Books. I'm so thrilled to have you all here with us today for our, our ongoing virtual author event series, which we've been doing since, oh, early April or so. And it's been about two or three events a week since then. And it's been really great to stay connected with all of you and, and find some way to tether ourselves to our audience. And, and I keep calling it a mixtape. Uh, we've been trying to give you a um, kind of a nice balance between, you know, really topical things, serious issues that we're dealing with right now, but also some lighter fare that we can escape and take a break and maybe laugh a little and, and not think about the news for, for a moment or two. Um, and we're going to keep doing that. I would say just candidly, we probably won't be doing any in-person events at least until spring, summer next year, who knows when, but we're going to keep doing these and stay connected with all of you. We've got a few fun things coming up. Um, next Monday, we're going to be talking with uh, Matthew McConaughey and Woody Harrelson, which is going to be quite a, uh, quite a night. That day, actually, Monday at 3 p.m., we're doing an event with Neil Gaiman in conversation with Marlon James, the Man Booker Prize winning author of uh, Brief History of Seven Killings. And then the next day, one week from today, we're talking with John Grisham about his sequel to A Time to Kill, which the movie starred Matthew McConaughey. So it's some weird world we're living in where everything's connected and uh, this strange, strange moment, but a lot of cool stuff coming up. Um, we were supposed to be having an event this Friday with Aaron Brockovich, talk about water policy and different things like that. I think that's getting bumped to November. So if you're planning on that, we still are gonna have that event but there's a new date that we're looking at. So stay tuned and we'll fill you in on when that gets rescheduled. Um, so I'm so thrilled to have this event tonight. Um, our guest, New York Times bestseller, you know, one of our best, I think, narrative nonfiction writers that we have in America today, Sarah Smarsh. We had Sarah with us. We were saying maybe last year, it feels like 17 years ago now, but Sarah joined us for an event for her wonderful book, Heartland, um, which was a National Book Award finalist. And we, we did a really fun event in the basement uh, jazz club underneath the bookstore. And uh, which, you know, we're certainly not going to be going into cramped <laughs> basement clubs anytime soon. So it was a, it's a nice memory that we actually got to do that at one point. But uh, when I heard that there was this new book coming out, um, which was something, you know, I, I think if you... Uh, Red Heartland, you know, I think it's both expected because of the kind of connections to the work that Sarah has done, but also, you know, uh, kind of such a fun, uh, not, not a detour, but we'll talk about that. It's a wonderful book called She Come By It Natural. It's about Dolly Parton, it's about class, it's about wealth and equality, it's about all the issues that um, Sarah has written about before, and in some ways, the things that um, kind of define a lot of her work as a journalist. So it's been really fun to read that. and. Um, Kind of see the parallels while also looking at the life and work of someone who is a true living legend in so many different ways. So Sarah, welcome back and I'm excited to chat with you. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. And um, that stop that I made um, in, in that jazz bar, jazz club underground is one of my favorites of my um, paperback book tour. And now it just seems like like a, a, a precious thing. Cause like you said, like that sort of space, we're not gonna, we're gonna be there anytime soon no. had we only known, but, uh, but thanks for having me back. I'm a yeah. big fan of what y'all do. Thank you so much. Uh, before we get going too much, I wanna say we're gonna be posting links in the chat here so you guys can get your copies of the book. It's a wonderful gift. I, I don't, you know, I say that about every book but this really is, you know, we're gonna talk a little bit about the, the the blurred lines of interest that Dolly Parton offers. And, and this is a book that will appeal to a lot of different people. So we'll put links in there. If you guys have questions, please put those in the Q&A and we'll try to get to those as we go. Um, I guess my question is first, um, what was the motivating factor that led you to want to write anything about Dolly Parton? Well, unfortunately, this answer is going to require 
you all to um, travel back in time to a year known as 2016. <laughs> um, depending on your politics, I suppose it was a, a, a kind of horrifying year um, in our uh, national trajectory politically, socially. And um, so as, as I document in Heartland, I come from a poor rural background. I grew up on a, a struggling family wheat farm in Kansas. And, and, and I write about socioeconomic class in, in pretty overt terms, often as it you know, intersects with gender, race, and, and all sorts of other identity markers. Well, in 2016, all of a sudden, my people, if you will, were um, just like in all the political headlines, but it was, it was this version of that place and demographic that you know, certainly there's some truth to, but it isn't the whole story. So the, uh, the, the, the MAGA hat, rural white dude um, spewing bigotry at the diner on Main Street was like, it, it became a, a, a trope really in media. And that same year in 2016, Dolly Parton had a new album come out for the first time in a long time. And she did this big arena tour. And I was thinking, a, here we have this big figure who famously comes from a poor rural background, poor rural white um, place. And she exemplifies like the, the best of the, you know, parallel culture that, that I know in Kansas. B, there was a whole bunch of misogyny going down that year because Hillary Clinton was of course the uh, democratic candidate for president. And so I was thinking a lot about feminism as a movement and as an experience and where are we in that, you know, arc that we hope is um, long and bending towards justice. And a lot of the discourse I was keenly aware would be inaccessible to the very powerful and truly feminist women who raised me. And what I mean by that is, um, that movement, just like a, a lot of movements, has a sort of class fracture in it in terms of who is at the march. Um, racial fractures too, no doubt. As someone who I write from a vantage that is involves kind of like simultaneous uh, racial privilege and economic disadvantage. And from that lens, um, I'm very sensitive to the, the extent to which the fact that I a, was a first generation college student sort of separates me from the people I love the most in my relationship to something like feminism with a capital F. And so I really wanted to talk about how, um, you know, feminism as a philosophy and an aspiration can be experiential and lived and embodied without even necessarily being articulated or self-conscious. And there's something important to examine there, I think. And Dolly Parton then, you know, out on the, on her tour, it occurred to me, exemplifies what I would call kind of a working class feminism. Um, so I, I applied to a, a great magazine called No Depression, had a fellowship, a new fellowship for a writer to examine the intersection between roots music and broader culture and society. And so I pitched this idea and I spent uh, a year writing this as a serial uh, if in magazine form. And, uh, and now happily it's bound in a book in 2020. You know, it's funny, you know, I, I think, um you were talking about kind of the, the broad swath of people that someone like Dolly Parton uh, appeals to. I wonder if we think of Dolly Parton, just play a game, we'll pretend that she's a politician, right? Who would her constituency be? Because it would be so broad and vast. Who, who would be in the constituency of a Dolly Parton? Oh man, well, this is a good opportunity for me to point out my button that says Dolly for president, the <laughs> shameless marketing. I got it from my beloved publisher, but, um, but I think it's, it, that's actually, um, I don't think that the, uh, the, the idea of a spoiler really applies to, to a book, uh, in this particular form. So I'll say that one of the last lines of, of the book is Dolly Parton for president refers to uh, a bumper sticker on her dad's pickup. And um, so, so the thing is, she's just like universally beloved to such an extent that if she were a political figure, it would be, it would totally rock the system. She's, she's like transcendent across so many lines. 
And all you need to do to, to know that firsthand is to go to one of her shows. When I, I went to a couple stops on that arena tour in 2016 and, and I was blown away because like I'd never been to one of her shows before. You know, when I was coming up, we, there wasn't money for concerts. And, um, you know, I, I early in my career, I, I covered a lot of what some people call alt country for alt weeklies actually as kind of a culture writer. And so I've always been, um, you know, kind of aficionado of what we might call old country or today they refer to it as Americana and so on. Um, so I, I've been, been to a lot of shows in my day, but not a whole lot of like big iconic arena shows. And, but, but hers are a thing apart regardless because at that show you're gonna see among the throngs, a dude, wearing muddy boots and a t-shirt that says proud redneck. You're gonna see a group of drag queens on a night out and they're like turning around instructing the dudes with muddy boots to sway to um, you know, like a slow dolly song and damned if they aren't swaying. And you're gonna see every color of people. You're gonna see every age. You're gonna see like goth teenagers. You're gonna see old men in, in cowboy hats and boots. Um, I mean, it is, it's actually giving me goosebumps right now, just thinking about it and remembering it because it, it was real, man. And that that was happening in 2016 when it was kind of the dawn of this, this moment that we're experiencing where the social fabric is so stretched and torn in some ways. And while she didn't really make any explicit statements to that end, you know, she, she was like alluding to the environment outside of that, um, performance center and saying, wouldn't it be nice if this love that we're all feeling in here, if we could take a little vial of this with us when we leave. So all of this is a long way of saying Dolly Parton will never be a politician. And that's the irony and the paradox of her, um, her just universal appeal, I guess. Um, I guess to follow up on that question, and I guess in some ways it's both unanswerable, but also kind of speaks to the thesis of the book is you just said all that. The question is why, you know, mm. Why is, why is that broad swath of uh, people interested in what she provides? I'm gonna try to quantify this with like three points. Okay, let's say one, she's a creative genius and her music's incredible. We could, while there aren't many people that are at her level in that regard, though you know we we could say there, there are other folks that that description would apply to and and yet that doesn't that doesn't give us the whole answer because they aren't universally beloved so let's add to that number two um she's real she's authentic in a way that you know especially in the well i don't know about especially in the music industry but there's definitely been you know over the course of dolly's career which began in the 1960s she was born in 1946 um, over the course of those decades, um, popular culture shifted dramatically in terms of how we receive, you know, the way in which something is, is packaged and delivered to us. So, so there's a lot more, um, the, the, the kind of like manufactured star that's, that, that has to some extent been a phenomenon since the beginning of Hollywood and Nashville and all of those sorts of power centers of entertainment. But, there, I think that today it's it's more the rule rather than 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 the exception, and I think that Dolly's authenticity and her ownership of a you know a like the 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 life of a, of a country song she lived it in in a deep and true way that maybe is hard to come by in uh, in entertainment today. And then the most important thing, though, by far by leaps and bounds, like eighty seven percent of the answer to this question is her, um, you know, I would say uh, her, her just exuding what we could only call grace, love, goodness, and it's real. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm suspicious of, of people sometimes with their virtue signaling, but that isn't what she's doing. She's, and you look back over the course of her career and every decision she made, every movie role she took, every, um, you know, artists that she helped boost along the way, every statement she made in her songwriting. It's all about social progress, yes, but also a, a very inclusive version of that. And, you know, again, that comes back to the diversity of her crowds. They feel that um, she is what, what, what we might call a true Christian. She's, she does not pass judgment. Uh, she loves and accepts and celebrates everyone, regardless of their identity, their gender, their race, and so on. 
and um and it's so real that you feel it and i think that um i think that's the bulk of what people are responding to when you think about the intangibles of that um you know obviously she's not like you said you know she's not the only genius songwriter she's not the only person who's come from nothing and you know as someone who's i guess who kind of owned that mantle was Loretta Lynn kind of owned the, I come from deep Appalachia. I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of the coal miner's daughter, right? She owned that for a long time, but in some ways she became someone who was not ultimately knowable the way that Dolly Parton is, you know, the way you think you know someone, the biggest, it's like the Oprah factor. It's the Tom Hanks thing. Yeah. It's, it's something that's, you can't put your finger on that makes you feel that even though you've never met this person, you'll probably never meet this person. That if you some for some reason did, you feel like you'd hit it off immediately. Yeah, yeah. I think she's um, you know, the this word just occurred to me, and I, I hadn't really thought of it in these terms prior to this chat, but but she's really what she has in common with like Oprah and other icons that are that sort of um they're sort of like leaders outside of the political sphere by way of the entertainment industry from improbable origins. What a lot of them have in common is I would say they're, they're healers of sorts somehow through communication and the way that they interact with and engage with their fans and followers. So um, yeah, Loretta Lynn, a genius for sure, for sure has an authentic country story um but she, you know dolly ended up being she's like a, a multifaceted powerhouse of like you've got i mean hell dollywood and the tourism industry she created in tennessee according to a study by the university of tennessee pumps like 1.5 billion dollars into the state economy every year um she's incredibly generous with her philanthropy she's got this literacy initiative for kids that's given away like 150 million books um so since like the mid 90s um so and, and she's also a prolific songwriter loretta lynn was as well but i think you fold into dolly's story a really sharp business acumen so there are a lot of stories in the book about how she made some very calculated and brilliant business chess moves earlier er, early in her career when basically bad male advisors were telling her to do something different and those decisions made her not just very rich but really the 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 owner of a canon of music that has been covered by countless people and um and it, it makes her richer every time the song plays. <laughs> yeah, you know it's funny. You know, it, it, I I think um, I think I was I don't know. I think nine to five comes out in nineteen eighty. So that's the year I was born. And um, Same. yeah, and so that seems like a really interesting point for her because up till that moment, of course, she you know she'd gone solo. She'd been doing some amazing work and had already broken out. Um, with with I think what some, some people probably still consider some of her best work up to that point but that kind of took her to a different level not just because of the acting but because of the issues connected to that film now there was a danger there right and we're talking 1980 we're talking five years after the end of the Vietnam War she's associating herself with Jane Fonda who was kind of a pariah at that point still of the right you know Hanoi Jane all these things but for some reason, she that she's done these things like that. She, you know, she she's like friends with Jane Fonda. She's doing movies about feminism, all these things. But it kind of it doesn't change the narrative as far as she wasn't losing droves of fans. You didn't see like the Beatles where they were doing steamrollers over records and stuff. How do you think she's kind of avoided getting kind of pinned in one way or another with some label like that? Well, I think this gets back to sort of the crux of, or, or my impetus for kind of the underlying thesis of the book with that sort of distinction between um, feminism as a political statement and feminism embodied or exuded or experienced at the ground level. And, you know, she, she never, sh she, she's a truth teller and that you, all you have to do is listen to her, her early dark uh, songs that are very much documenting uh, what it means to be a poor rural woman in a man's world to know that what what she's a, she, she doesn't shy away from 
what we might term political statements and yet the way in which she conveys it the vessel that she uses or the the language um, that she gives it never feels political and that's um as someone who kind of because of the sort of gap between where i come from and what i do professionally in class terms i can i can tell you that that's a a very delicate um dance to pull off to basically like have the understanding that she has acquired through her you know extreme worldliness um that that she already possessed by 1980 in her mid 30s and yet have such what i i think is just um concern for and respect for the people where she comes from to know that like you know here I, I say in the acknowledgments of the book, like, I don't ever want to presume to know, you know, the, the deepest truths of Dolly Parton, because those are hers alone. But from my lens, and what I see is that she's someone who, um, you know, she, she knows the folks back home who might bristle, they might, they not be, they might not be into Jane Fonda. Um, they might not like the term feminism. They maybe have been um, successfully reached by political factions that have weaponized that term and that idea. Nonetheless, they are, you know, just the statement that I make in this book, many of them living and breathing feminism without talking about it or, or even realizing it. It's just a way of life and it's how you survive if you're a poor woman. So I think that she was cognizant of that of that uh, dissonance and chose early on to, rather than talking about anything, just she would walk it. And so she's always walking the walk and not necessarily talking the talk, but meanwhile, not vilifying or criticizing the people who are talking the talk. Um, you know, and one can do both, but one can also do one without the other. And, um, and I think that, you know, for better or worse, her staying off the to the talk aspect of it is one of the reasons that um, that she never she never caught hell for what were nonetheless, um, you know, arguably quite risky decisions in terms of making a political statement. I found it fascinating that even uh, this summer after the um, George Floyd mur murder and all the different things that happened, there was a big cycle of news where Dolly Parton is in the news again. And she is getting quoted as saying, this is her quote. This was an interview she gave to Billboard magazine. They said, she said, quote, I understand people having to make themselves known and felt seen. And of course, Black Lives Matter. Do we think our little white asses are the only ones that matter? No. What I think is so fun about that is she took the issue head on. She said Black Lives Matter but she did it in a way in keeping with whatever the brand is. And it kind of still just kind of like water off a duck's back. It just kind of was like, boom. And it became news, but it didn't have any long-term effect on her. It was like, yeah, Dolly Parton said Black Lives Matter, you know? And mm -hmm. my question for you is, do you think that, um, do you think that that is in any way something where she knows that her voice is needed for a certain audience and she wants to do that? Or is that, like you said, just her, she got asked the question and she's gonna tell you, you know, what she thinks. Well, the, here's my take on that. For her, and, and I don't think folks who, who know her and, you know, who she has collaborated with, the, with in the past and just her heart of hearts, I don't think would be surprised by the contents of what she said. Some people might be surprised that she seemingly made an explicit political statement, but I would say, mm, pause there because to, to her and you have to, she has a, a very much a um, a, a Christian lens, and, and I mean that in a, the so, sort of most like liberal form of the theology, um, Black lives mattering and, and a, a, a Black man having the, um, uh, ha his, his own physical person and life being endangered just walking down the street. For Dolly Parton, that's not, that's not politics, that's, that's morality. That's like right and right or wrong. There's no like, you know, we, we've been in this like rightward drift politically for so long as a culture that I, my own media industry often is, is, is doing this like two sides, pitting them against each other as moral equivalents. 
still um, when when one side to my mind has really sort of gone off the rails and is now um, it's so much of what we're discussing is just about human decency and rights and um, issues that have been with us since our foundation, of course, um, but that they're coming to a head now in many ways and that and I think that you're right that Dolly sensed that um, apparently not everyone gets this and I, and I need to say this. I would add that in that same billboard, uh, and by the way, my like my one regret about the book is that it went to print in, in June. It was like two months before that interview came out. Um, so the introduction as, as folks will find it in the book kind of leaves it an open-ended question how she'll respond um, to the kind of racial tensions and uprisings. Um, but there's another way that she came up uh, in the context of that moment last summer when a lot of the Confederate statues were being ripped down. There was like a petition going around to um, replace uh, a statue in Tennessee with a bust of Dolly Parton. <laughs> and it was like, that, that got a lot of attention. Um, but anyway, she, uh, she runs a lot of, you know, I mentioned her kind of like inter tourist enterprises and, um, she has this like dinner theater attraction that's super cheesy that used to be called Dixie Stampede. And I write about in the book how um, a, uh, a black female writer called out the kind of like really offensive whitewashing of the Civil War basically that goes on in the, the, the production that's tied to this dinner theater. And um, after considering that, Dolly, they, they, took, they removed the word Dixie from the name of the attraction is now just called Stampede. The extent to which there are still problems with, you know, the, the presentation and, and the performance, um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure I could speak to that today. But um, I, I wanted to just mention that because famously the Dixie Chicks dropped uh, the Dixie from their name uh, this past summer in response to in a moment of a lot of white performers and leaders sort of being humbled and realizing that they had um, their privilege blinders had had caused them to err. And um, and so Dolly talked a little bit about that decision, which she previously hadn't expanded on in that billboard interview. And she's like, well, what once someone pointed out to me that it was hurtful, they we wasn't even a question. We took the we took that word out. My my intention is never to harm someone. She said. However, some of us can be guilty of. Um, I don't know if she said innocent ignorance. That wouldn't quite be the right term. But but she basically said, I'm learning as I go, and I'm aspiring to do better in a world full of inequality. Um, and she she's obviously mindful of her white privilege. Yeah. Um. I want to talk a little bit about, you mentioned the fact that she kind of practices this kind of um, quiet feminism and just kind of walks the walk instead of you know, talking the talk. And, and I'm curious, you know, she, she was born at the very early part of the baby boom. She's kind of a very early baby boomer. And I once read that, you know, there's no baby boomer, you know, woman, no female baby boomer or anyone before that generation that has not been sexually harassed or dealt with some of those things in the workplace or any, anywhere. It really, it's a kind of a generational shift that occurred that some of the laws and even practices that were put into place in the 1980s and maybe in the 90s just didn't exist really before that. And I wonder, you know, you do see a um, behavioral difference in kind of the generations of feminists activists. There's kind of a quiet fortitude in a certain way to certain like the kind of baby boom era. And I just wonder how you see her generational stance playing into the way she deals with these issues. Well, I think that, um, you know, I, I think that her class and plate and, and geographic background probably have more to do with her relationship to feminism than her generation. And the reason I say that is uh, among her generation, she was actually incredibly radical and, and progressive in some ways um, in regard to gender. So, um, you know, people refer to the the second wave feminism that basically would have been when when Dolly was a, a grown woman who had come into her own and then that that movement was happening in the streets and it was very much centered on 
college campuses to some extent. Um, it was uh, there. There was rampant, you know, racism and classism within that movement. And I think Dolly was one of the folks that maybe felt like she didn't like get an, an entry pass, and maybe she wouldn't have wanted it. But um, but that movement, one of the um, you know, kind of debates was the extent to which the oppressive markers of of um, the female gender in our society, the extent to which they should or should not be uh, embraced and leveraged. So let's say that you have, you spend an hour on your hair, you put on makeup, you wear high heels that hurt your feet. Um, back then, you know, they're wearing like girdles and those basically like a modern day corset. And, um, and there were, there I, I think that sort of like the, the prevailing stereotype of that movement, at least, was the, a, a woman that, that sort of, um, you know, shunned um, those, you know, employing those devices for any sort of power and instead chose to, you know, refuse um, what, what they deemed to be um, oppressive assignments for their, for their gender. Dolly Parton went com in completely the opposite direction. She was like, not only am I going to do those things, I'm going to like amplify them by one million and become almost a caricature of what, you know, frankly is, is sort of like um, uh, almost um, pornographic, uh, you know, sense of the female form. And simultaneously, I'm going to be a creative genius and outsmart all the guys in the room on business. And the incredible paradox in that, first, the, 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 the radical nature of her doing that at her age and at that time, um, you know, there are a lot of young artists today who, you know, we might say, objectify themselves or use that as a, a an, an, what we might call third wave feminist um, self-empowerment. Um, but I write in the book that she was kind of like the original third wave feminist. So she, so she was sort of radical in expressing a form of feminism. And yet, to your point, she was very subdued in talking about feminism. So there's a lot of layers to what was going on uh, with the statements she was ma making back then. And, and I think it's, it's very interesting to look at in, in light of uh, where we are today. You know, when I was growing up, Dolly Parton was a little bit of a caricature, like you said, kind of a cartoon of a person, uh, not just because of the way she kind of looked and presented herself, but at, you know, when I was late 80s, 90s, her music wasn't like at the forefront of what I was listening to. And I probably was in my 20s before I would go back and listen to some of the earlier music. I would say that kind of Jolene era music mm -hmm. um, and around that, even before that, even the stuff she did with Porter Wagner and some of those things mm -hmm. too. And it took me some time to kind of value her as the artist that she is. You know, did, did her music play a role in your life growing up? You know, what's your earliest memory of listening mm -hmm. to Dolly Parton? It did play a role, but I wasn't, um, you know, people might be surprised to know that someone that who, who wrote a book with Dolly Parton on the cover was didn't grow up as like a Dolly Parton super fan. You know, I, I was just, I was steeped in country music and specifically, uh, you know, a kind of older style that predates the, the more uh, pop country direction that started going in when, when you and I were young. Um, but uh, my first very specific memory involving Dolly's music um, and I write about this in the book. My, we we did had a lot of highway time. We'd be on 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 the these two lane blacktop roads in southern Kansas, going you know the long distance to school, the grocery store. Everything you know was um, involved a lack of geographic proximity. And so we're in the pickup truck or the car a lot. And um, my grandma, who who largely raised me, had a Dolly Parton tape. And uh, I don't know if it was like a greatest hits compilation or what I don't, don't remember, but we were just kind of sitting there quietly. My grandma's like smoking her god awful generic cigarettes. Um, no windows cracked, by the way. <laughs> and um, and <laughs> coat of many colors comes on, and and my I noticed my grandma um, tearing up, and she started crying at that song. And the reason that that memory, uh, you know, just seared me and that I, I can just smell and hear and feel it today is um, 
gosh, I, I could count on one hand the time, number of times I've seen my grandma cry. And one of them was at the mercy of a Dolly Parton song. <laughs> Do you see any, um, I was trying to think of um, current day analogs for, you know, who Dolly Parton was and if her place in American culture will remain forever unique or if there are anyone, if there's anyone that kind of carries on that same style, you know, one, just being relevant for as long as she has, two, having the actual chops as an artist, you know, that's the most important part. And then three, kind of being omnipresent in media. Does, does anybody, you know, I mean, outside of like Beyonce or somebody, I don't know who that would be. Right. You know, if we maybe jump to some other genres, we, we could come up with some parallels. But you, let's just starting within country music, broadly speaking, I, I, there's no one that, you know, there are people who are, are, and women specifically, who are great songwriters, who are doing something interesting with a progressive statement about gender, who are, you know, there are women who are doing all the things that she does, but no one that's doing all of them <laughs> like she has always done. And, um, uh, and then if we expand to, to other genres, you know, Beyonce comes to mind as someone who is just as iconic that, you know, that said, um, uh, the, the extent to which her business empire will or won't rival Dolly's would, would remain to be seen, I suppose. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think there, there uh, I, I feel safe saying unequivocally there will, there will never be another Dolly Parton. And, yeah, and I mean, she's kind of a one of yeah. one for sure. Yeah. I, mean, I was trying to think about someone like a, you know, you, you're right. There's kind of bits and pieces, like someone like a Taylor Swift kind of has the songwriting, the, the talent mm -hmm. portion, but she doesn't have the rags to riches story, you know? And so right. it, it's, that, it's that unique blend of all the different things that kind of make yep. her unique. Um, do you have any, when you wrote this original piece for, no depression, um, and since that time, and now that it's a book, have you ever gotten word of any sense that Dolly Parton has had any uh, response to what you've written about her? Well, first, let me tell you that like a proper journalist, I hounded the hell out of her management when I embarked on this project and I was not high enough on the, you know, in the pecking order to get an interview. Um, but as far as now, a few years later, we, uh, my publisher did recently hear from, you know, like Team Dolly, um, I think specifically in response to uh, the, the most recent issue of The New Yorker ran a, a yeah. big, wonderful piece that yeah. um, is sort of an expanded review of sorts. Um, and, uh, and in response to, to having seen that piece, which they were pretty excited about, you know, I was, uh, or we were invited to send them some copies and so I, you know, wrote a, a hopeful note personalized to her in the in case she uh, gets a hold of it. But we'll see. Well, that's interesting. That you, I just read the New Yorker piece, which is great. Uh, congrats on that. But um, what's interesting about that too is if an artist stays around long enough, there's this kind of I don't know what it is. Obviously, I think she's always been taken seriously as a songwriter, but they weren't writing about her in the 1970s in the New Yorker, you know, there's something that comes with being kind of the grand dame of country music or whatever that finally, you know, gets a certain, I, I you know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm not articulating that the right way, but it doesn't seem like in 1986, they'd be writing articles about Dolly Parton in the New Yorker. Or yes. anything about her, but she's kind of even now breaking through to kind of different audiences, you know? Yes. And this, I, I live for this, these kind of the, the blurring of class lines in a sense who, who you know, she's always been, um, you know, you couldn't argue with her chops as a, a, um, a role in popular culture, but to be considered seriously um, for what I call the greatest gender performance of all time for her songwriting, for her business acumen uh, and her philanthropy and, and progressive ideas and all of that. Um, I mean, I, I just today got my, I'm a print subscriber to Harper's um, and, you know, you couldn't come up with a more sort of uh, intellectual American publication than theirs. And um, happily, they, they reviewed the book and I was just like, oh, to see Dolly Parton discussed in Harper's just makes my heart <laughs> sing because it's it's the the validation in some ways, not only of a genre and a craft, but 
but a, a people and a place and a perspective that um, when I was a kid, I, it, it was hard, hard to find. Yeah. I want to remind people while we have a few minutes left to chat, if you haven't gotten a copy of the book, please look to the chat function here. And we have some links in there where you can get your copy of this wonderful book. Also, make sure if you have some questions, you can uh, throw those in the Q&A. That's it right there. And Sarah and I will be doing a duet of Islands in the Stream at the end of the at the end of the I'll tell you that long before this <laughs> book was a, a sparkle in my eye. Islands in the Stream is the only song I've ever drunk karaoke as a duet. It was fate, you know, it was fate. Yeah. <laughs> Good timing too, of course, we just lost Kenny Rogers too. So, you know, the Dolly Parton, she was gonna end the news for that too. So yeah. uh, RIP Kenny Rogers. Um, yes. So I wonder, you, with Heartland, obviously you tapped into some interests uh, that carry over into this book, of course. And obviously, you know, you were writing that piece for the magazine at similar time periods. Where, what, what have you not, touched on yet about class and some of these issues that you feel because I, I know you you know as a creative person and a journalist you're obviously looking to uncover truth and talk about those kind of things but you certainly don't want to repeat yourself all the time what are some areas in this world that you kind of haven't done yet uh, this is such a great question. And I remember thinking, Jeff, when when we chatted last year, I remember thinking, this dude asks questions that nobody else asks. <laughs> and, um, and and I love that. And this falls in that category. And I have an answer as it happens. Yes. Um, uh, so, you know, Heartland, I was talking before about how my kind of just where I'm situated in the um, American story has to do um, with a simultaneous, um, you know, whiteness or racial privilege and economic disadvantage and, and trying to help lead some sort of nascent national discussion about what that means and what class is in this country, um, you know, has, has been my work thus far. And along the way I have tried and I, and I, I hope succeeded well enough at, um, you know, being mindful of all the other aspects of identity that class intersects with. So while I might have a sort of like class centric um, intention in um, a piece of criticism or a piece of writing, always I'm also thinking, well, how does this relate to race and how does this relate to gender and how does this relate to uh, sexual orientation and so on. Um, the moment that we find ourselves in, um, and I would say not just uh, 2020, but going back to 2014 and, and basically um, uh, the revelation um, among white folks ab about the um, peril faced by people of color and, and specifically black Americans um, has caused me to shift, you know, I'm always trying to be, the reason I became a journalist was to, um, was really for a civic purpose, to be somehow of service to this democratic experiment. And um, I think the way I can be of best service right now is to, is to, to center race and look at, at whiteness as a race and in, in some ways a problematic condition. And then my lens on that is, is sort of, you know, we'll have in, in large part to do with class, but um, basically I'm, I'm, I'm kind of trying to move toward, I guess, as, as folks would say, centering race in, in my next um, piece of writing that, that all the same will, will very much be about class and, and have recognizable themes for, for folks who have um, read my work. So that's what I'm up to right now. One of the things that I, I appreciate about you is you're not uh, shy to kind of talk about kind of uh, how pissed you are when people misrepresent these people in a way. And, and this seems to happen quite a bit. And certainly after 2016, in some ways, there was kind of a cottage industry made of trying to define the kind of white working class. And it was done, done well in some places like I love the book Dope Sick, for example, by Beth Mason. Yeah, so then, good. You know, I hate Hillbilly Elegy, you know, and I, I saw the trailer for this film the other day and it just like made me really pissed just even watching the trailer. Oh. And because it just almost seems like a joke, right? And um, you talk about caricatures, you talk about Dolly Parton as a character, it's almost impossible to see Glenn Close or Amy Adams or whatever portraying these people 
and not kind of feel, I don't know, it just doesn't feel gross. Right. Yeah, yeah, it feels gross. And I don't know why that is. I mean, they could be playing a million other people. It just feels, it doesn't feel like it's in the right place. But I, I just wonder when you see and hear things like that, does that still kind of get your blood boiling? And, and how do you feel about that? Um, you know, I have had to, you know, develop a pretty tough skin around that just because I, I'm, I'm always, you know, at the fore of that discussion and, and it would, would wear me out if I, if I let that stuff get to me. Um, I will say, now I haven't been able to bring myself to watch the Hillbilly Elegy trailer, I guess. So that tells you that, that it does, it is still capable of making my blood boil. It's yeah. like self-care, not hitting play. Um, but uh, I already know, I, I don't even need to watch. Um, yeah. So um, I have a friend in Appalachia who texted me when that movie was being filmed that there, there was a, a sign uh, that had been like, I don't know, stapled up to a, a light pole or something that said like seeking homeless types for movie extras. Um, homeless so types. the, sorry. Homeless types, homeless yeah. types. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, the reason that Dolly Parton's, you know, kind of using the term caricature in relationship to what she does is a very different thing than, than what we're talking about with the Ron Howard film is that um, it's the difference, forgive me for the, the clunky parallel um, because I, I never like to assert that, that um, race and class are, are somehow parallel conversations because they're not, but, um, this this might be a helpful analogy to say that you know it's it's the difference between a white person using the n word and a black person rightfully owning that word if they damn well please and doing whatever they want with it you know dolly parton's like i'm white trash and i will intentionally project that image my entire life and the point of everything she's doing and saying is clearly i am not actually trash um and no one would argue with that mission accomplished. Um, it's like you don't you don't you don't get to tell that story if you don't know it firsthand. Now one could argue that book was was written by someone from that place and, and who did live it firsthand. Um, so so it's a it's a kind of complicated discussion. But um, I, I I don't think it was done with with reverence. Um, no. and, uh, that's the difference. Yeah. Well, it, that leads me to kind of my final point I'd like to talk about, which is about authenticity and um, and when you think about journalism, I'm always torn by that because you know you talked about that kind of the reclaiming of certain labels and words and that's so important. But I do wonder, do you feel that journalists who have not experienced this are able to write about it truthfully? Because I do think, I, I don't prescribe to the fact that you can only write about the things that you've experienced personally. I mean, some of the greatest works of journalism were written by people that did not come from certain backgrounds. And you could argue that the greatest president for the lower classes was the one of the wealthiest presidents we ever had, right? FDR, you know, and so there are certain different things like that, but What's your kind of take as a journalist on kind of writing what you don't know? Well, um, I, I, I relate to this a little bit differently as a journalist and um, an, an, an author that's exploring a sort of like, you know, fact-based, absolutely, but also more um, creative and expansive form of the nonfiction genre. Um, but you know, a, a journalist's job is to you, often it's often it's best if you don't know shit about a story. It, it is to the the benefit of the story often if you are flat out clueless and you walk in with you know the the innocence of that ignorance um, to get the story, and that sort of um, keeps you from regurgitating some existing narrative that's already in your mind. The problem is when it comes to things like race and class. Uh, and social biases that we have all absorbed, um, you're, you're often not actually going, going into a story with you know, a, a, an innocent sort of ignorance. You might be aspiring to that sort of objectivity, but, but for all your best intentions, you will nonetheless face limitations 
in what you are able to perceive, no matter how deep your empathy runs. And the way I know that is I've worked in a lot of newsrooms where I was the only person who, who seemingly saw stories that had to do with poverty. And it was because I was the only person that lived it firsthand. It wasn't that I was like working with monsters who didn't care. <laughs> they just yeah. literally would like it. They, they wouldn't see the story. And there are, of course, um, racial parallels and all sorts of parallels, which is why uh, media and, and any uh, industry that's involved in setting the narratives of our country uh, needs to be diversified. Um, but, you know, that, that said, I, I'm with you that I don't want to live in a world where we're, we're giving each other, we're, we're, we're handing out assignments based on your identity. Um, that's a very different thing than like diversifying letters and newsrooms and university campuses and so on. Um, so, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't have time for our duet, I found. And someone just told me in my, <laughs> in my earpiece here, we don't have time for that. But I will say this, you know, one of my favorite radio shows forever is uh, on BBC. It's called Desert Island Discs. And it's the, I think mm -hmm. the longest running radio program. It started during World War II when they actually had records and stuff. And, and on the show, for those who don't uh, listen to it, it's basically they talk to different celebrities and musicians and not notable folks in the, in the UK. And they'll ask them, you know, if they got sent to a desert island. This may be where that comes from because it's such a trope at this point. Mm. If they got sent to a desert island, what they would take with them, they get to pick eight eight discs. But I would say, you know, if uh, if you have to remain quarantined for the next year, who knows, but uh, well, and you can only listen to a couple of Dolly Parton tunes over and over again, what what, what would you pick? Uh, so a lot of folks kind of like the lay Dolly Parton listener or fan, you know, Jolene. So what I like to tell people is, if you like Jolene, you'll love the bargain store. This song is so it's like, Everything we've been dis just been discussing about Dolly Parton is like um, it, it is is perfectly distilled in this song where she's telling the story of a woman who has been used uh, both emotionally and physically. Um, when at the time she was writing this song, I'm sure this would, was essentially code for "I'm not a virgin," um, and it, she uses as a metaphor the concept of like a of, of a secondhand item purchased in a thrift shop or at a yard sale and you know when I was growing up that was that we we owned very few things that were not previously owned by someone else and the fact that she takes that metaphor and then applies it to the female body is it's an it's a really powerful and strangely empowering uh song about the intersection of of gender and class um, and then you gotta, and, and it has the reason I sort of liken it to Jolene is it has that same dark, like minor key, almost kind of like exotic sound to it that, yeah. that it makes it a, a little bit um, set apart from some of her other music. And um, this is so cheesy, but I, I think that it's actually important to say it and admit it. Like the song nine to five is such a banger that I don't care how many times I've heard it, it makes me happy and it makes me sing every time. And I don't, I don't know if there's, there's one other piece of popular culture that's that overplayed um, uh, that, that I would, that I would like choose to take on a, to a desert island, but um, you know, to, to withstand a, another year of quarantine, you're going to need a cup of ambition. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Uh, so we got the bargain store and we got nine to five. I think that's a nice, that's a nice, uh, if, they, if we were making a 45, that'd make a great little record. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much. This was a blast. For those of you guys watching, if you haven't got a chance to get the book, please do so. We've got the links right here. Um, and I will also say, if you haven't had a chance to read Heartland, please get a copy of that. I think if you connect to the themes and issues she talks about in this book, you're going to love that book as well. So uh, take care, Sarah. Be well. And I hope we will see you again soon down the road. Same to you, Jeff. And thanks, everybody, for, for joining us tonight. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.